conference <clears throat> because I, I travel around, literally around the world at different churches, and it's very rare, and Anthony can attest to this, it's very rare to find teaching pastors, right? It really is. In Acts 20, Paul gives a farewell address to the, the pastors at Ephesus. And he says, I'm innocent of all man's blood because I do not shrink to declare the whole gospel of God, the whole counsel of scripture. He didn't leave anything out. And he says, I'm innocent of all man's blood, most likely alluding to Ezekiel 33, where we read, when you see the sword coming, you don't warn the people, God will hold their blood in your hands, right? Paul says, but I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I preached everything to you. And then he says to the pastors, watch out, right? Watch out for these, these false teachers. He calls them savage wolves that will come in. They won't spare the flock. But he says, guard the flock. Watch out for them. But you, pastors, you, you guys, the pastors, guard the flock. The term pastor, which is actual Latin term, but the Greek word literally means to, to, to guard. And the obligation of a pastor is to guard his flock, which the over, uh, Holy Spirit has made you overseers of, right? To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The primary responsibility of a pastor is to guard the flock, and the primary way of guarding the flock is to dispense sound doctrine, and Paul says, remember, I, I warned you night and day with tears for a period of three years. Now, have you ever heard a pastor warning his congregation with tears about false doctrine? Well, I think James is uh, one of those pastors. And uh, so it's a privilege for me to be here to speak at his church and to dispense the word of God to the people of God. And James and I were just talking about that sign, those signs, years and years and years ago. It was, I think, at your church. I have a picture of me speaking with those signs in the back. It was awesome. All right. Um, today, part one and two, I'm going to do part one, then I'm going to do part two, is dealing with the Holy Spirit in the context of the Trinity. Because if we just talk about the Holy Spirit... And don't mention the context of the Trinity. Well, you can get a bunch of different ideas as to the Holy Spirit and what he is. And you might even think, well, maybe not you guys. You have a good pastor. But others tend to think the Holy Spirit is disconnected from the Father and Son, at least ontologically, by nature. Like he's more of a, a secondary force. You got the, the big Father. You got the, the Son. And then you got this kind of force, right, that's thrown around, gives power, falls on people. Sometimes it can miss you and get the next guy. I mean, that's, look, I've seen that. I've seen that kind of teaching. So I want to teach about the Holy Spirit just in two parts. I'm not going to go long. Within the context of who God is. Because unless we emphasize the doctrine of the Trinity we'll be hopelessly confused every time we mention the Holy Spirit or talk about the nature of God. Because the nature of God does not merely consist on what he does. When we're talking about the nature of God, we're talking about who he is. We worship a God in Trinity. We worship a triune God. We sang an awesome hymn about the triune God. And... It seems to me, and I think Anthony and Pastor James would agree, the Trinity seems to be the red-headed stepchild in most Christian churches because it's always neglected. It's, you know, people are embarrassed to talk about it, mostly because they're not adequately equipped to teach it. So you never hear anything about the Trinity. In a lot of, far too many churches. Now, of course, there are really good churches out there that do emphasize it. 
But when we're talking about salvation, sanctification, justification, regeneration, it's all in the context of the triune God. We're not Jesus only, folks. We are saved because His work alone, but we're not saved because only that person of the Trinity. Who justifies us? Well, according to Romans 8.33, it's the Father that declares us righteous through the cross work the meritorious work of the Son, right? They, they send God the Holy Spirit to regenerate. You have the whole Trinity involved in our salvation. So you see how deadly it is to deny the Trinity. Nothing else works. If you don't have God as triune, you don't have anything. Hosea 6.6, 6, Yahweh says, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I delight in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Too many folks worship and all the time and Jesus is my hope and everything is great and they, they're excited to talk about the Lord and all these things. But you can be zealous with no knowledge or with a defective knowledge. And I, I do some open air evangelism with others. And um, it's amazing what I see on the streets in terms of open air evangelism, some of the signs they have, and some of the, just hearing the content, it's horrible. It's a very incomplete, defective, disjointed gospel. We need strong people to go out. We need missionaries also, but we need the right ones with the right message. I delight in the knowledge of God rather than all the works you do. In fact, in Proverbs 15, uh, the author says, The works of the unrighteous or the wicked are an abomination to my sight. Look, I always tell the Roman Catholic, it's better for you to stay home and don't do any works because it's worse for you if you're rejecting Christ by rejecting his cross work and then doing works. It's worse for you because you're increasing your abomination. It's abominable to the Lord maintaining a false Christ or something wrong about his works, an insufficient, impotent Christ and doing works. Stay home. It's much better for you. The Trinity is, um, and I want to establish the Trinity before we go into the Holy Spirit, because I think it's important. And we can't get enough of Trinitarian doctrine. I can hear it all day long. It's one of the most important doctrines because it defines who God is. And I, I always mention this, hopefully after this conference, you'll stop using Trinitarian analogies like the egg and water and all these other things because none of them work. Here's the rule. Stay biblical. That's the rule. Stay biblical. There's enough biblical data to use to affirm the Trinity in which we don't have to use. Analogies that are so defective, none of them work. They're either oneness or they're LDS. The Trinity simply is one God revealed in three persons. Or I like to say there's there's three distinct persons who share the nature. Share the nature of the one God. The primary argument against the Trinity, and you'll know this when you speak to Muslims and Jehovah's Witnesses and other Unitarian groups, one of the main arguments simply is this, Unitarianism. What's Unitarianism? Well, it's a belief that simply... It's a belief that God exists as one person or unipersonalism. If God exists as one person, says the Jehovah's Witness, in no way can Jesus be God because there's only one person, Jehovah. Say with Muslims. I mean, they all use the same argument. God is Unitarian in which Jesus cannot be God. So they argue not monotheism, but unipersonalism. God, yes, has revealed himself as one being, as one what, or one being revealed in three persons. Monotheism, the belief of one God, 
not one person, but one being, is the very foundation of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, you've probably heard many arguments about the Trinity was invented in 325, and none of the early church fathers taught it, and so on and so forth. But, of course, if we had time, we'd, we can go through a lot of patristic or early church father sources but that affirm the Trinity before Nicaea. We don't, but I would suggest that you get some good patristic sources to study these things out. And they're not complicated stuff. They affirm the concept of the Trinity. The concept of the Trinity. Yes, they did not have formal, uh, the skill to use formal language or doctrinal terms that we use today. But the question is, did they hold to the concept of a triune God and not a Unitarian God? And answer is yes. I like what Ignatius says. Ignatius was a very early church father. He said <coughs> in his letter to the Romans, he wrote a genuine letter to the Romans um, in chapter 3, for our God, Jesus Christ, for our God, Jesus Christ, he uses this phrase, our God or the God, our God, Jesus Christ. And not in the context of modalism, there's nowhere in Ignatius' writings that he teaches that Jesus is the Father, but rather the converse is found. He's distinct from the Father. Our God, Jesus Christ, now that he is with the Father, is more revealed in his glory. Christianity is not a thing of silence only, but also of greatness. Our God, Jesus Christ, who is with the Father. And there's many other quotations um, that we can look at. Um, let me give one more. Clement of Alexandria. Now, he wrote around one, 190 A.D. Clement wrote around 105, 107 A.D. Now, these are very early citations of early church fathers. Listen to Clement of Alexandria. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not affirming in any way, shape, or form that the church fathers is some kind of hermeneutic to interpret the scripture. But we can look at the patristic record and get a lot of this stuff that affirms our faith today. And as I pointed out, all, frequently I point out this out, most Christians don't know how to read the church fathers because it was just a different language. They lack the articulation of formal doctrinal words that we use today. But nevertheless, it's what they mean and what they communicated. Clement of Alexandria wrote around AD 190. He says, listen to this, 190, years before Nicaea, for I understand nothing else except the Holy Trinity to be meant. For the third is the Holy Spirit, the second, the Son, by whom all things were made according to the will of the Father. Stromata, Book 5. It can be summed up by one of the greatest patristic authorities, J.D. Kelly, who said this, The reader should notice how deeply the conception of the plurality of divine persons was imprinted in the apostolic, these were the apostolic church fathers, apostolic tradition and the popular faith. Moving on, we have to understand at this juncture that there is a difference between essential theology and secondary theology, right? Essential theology, as I define it, simply put, has to do with the person, nature, and finished work of Christ. That's essential doctrines. So that includes him as the second person of the Trinity. Why do we call him a second person? Is there a fourth person? Well, we use these terms, as the early church actually did, to define by way of revelation. The Son is presented, then the Holy Spirit is presented and emphasized. We are not saying that the Trinity is nowhere found in the Old Testament. We're saying these words, first and second and third person, the Trinity, are revelation terms, not ontological terms. And as we'll see, the Trinity is a, was clearly established in the Old Testament when Anthony uh, speaks today. Essential doctrine versus peripheral doctrine or secondary. Essential doctrine has to do with the person, nature, and finished work of Christ. Right? So you got the Trinity, you got the deity of Christ, 
but you have his finished work. That's essential. Why is that essential? Well, Paul said it was. He says, if you don't believe in the cross work of Christ, I'm paraphrasing him in Galatians, he says that's a different gospel. And he's writing this as an anti-Judaizer polemic. Let him be a curse if you're going to preach a different gospel than justification, salvation through faith alone. So Roman Catholics can say, I hold to the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity and all these things. But if you reject his work, you don't believe in the Christ that I believe in, who said, as Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 1.30, where we read Paul, Christ is our, he's the wisdom of God, but he's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. He became to us our redemption. So if you boast, you cannot boast of yourself, but of Christ alone, of God alone. That's essential doctrine, of course, this peripheral doctrine. And we'll touch on some peripheral doctrine, like gifts of the Spirit, um, end time theology, and all these other things, the, the mark, the name or the mark or the number of the beast. And we can go on and on with peripheral theology. But Christianity is defined by the finished work and nature and person of Christ. Normally when I teach on the Trinity, as it relates to the Holy Spirit, I find in Scripture there are three facts, fundamental truths. There's one God, right? That's fact number one. Scripture presents there's one God all over the place. Fundamental truth number two, there's three persons presented as God or Yahweh. And we see this in the New Testament as well. Three persons presented as God, not just called God or Yahweh, but actually presented as God, the creator of all things. And number three, the third fundamental truth, the three persons are distinct from each other, right? Three truths of the Trinity. One God, which everyone, not too many people disagree with that, unless you're a Mormon. Of course, they will say, yeah, we believe in one God. And you press them, well, I don't think you do. And they'll say, yeah, we do. We believe in one God. But what they mean is they worship one God for this world. And actually, Bruce McConkie, who was an LDS apostle, said... These are the only three gods that we worship, referring to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you even have confusion within Mormon general authorities. But nevertheless, they play semantics. But for us, there's one God. We see there's numerous passages that teach monotheism, one being, Deuteronomy 6 4, um, Isaiah 43 10, and many others. Number two, there's three persons. Why do we call them persons? Why do we call the Holy Spirit and the Father a person? Well, they're not, and we have to make this clear when we talk to opposing groups, when we talk to Unitarians, when we say person, we do not mean people, right? See, if you're a people, you're necessarily a person, But if you're a person, you're not necessarily a people. In other words, angels and Satan, they're defined as persons, but they're not people. Because they have personal attributes. And personal attributes, as we'll see, personal attributes and personal characteristics, I think, constitute personhood. Number two, the three persons, this is fact number two. Remember, there's one God, and number two, there's three persons presented as God. Three persons or three self-aware subjects presented as God. Fully as God. The Father, we see this in Paul's salutations. The normal word for the Father, according to the Apostle, was God. Right? Theos, God. The person of the Son, as we'll see, the person of the Holy Spirit. Three persons present as fully God. The person of the Son, I just want to take a few minutes on this. The person of the Son is presented as God, but he's also presented as the Yahweh in several Old Testament passages. 
And this is in a religious context. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Jesus is presented as, as Theos and Kyrios, Lord and, or God and Lord, in a religious context. In other words, the word for Lord can mean Sir. It's a polite way of greeting someone. It could mean that in the Greek text. But in a religious context, or when an author is quoting the Old Testament, it's on the same plane of equality as that, the, as that of the word God. Lord and God, the same plane of equality. Right? In fact, in the Old Testament, the word Lord, kurios in the Greek, is from what? Normally, when they would quote it in the New Testament, all these quotations we find. Now, most of the authors of the New Testament quoted from the Septuagint, which was the Greek Old Testament, where we find the word kurios translated from the Hebrew Yahweh. Right? Like in um, Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the same Lord as verse 9. What does verse 9 say of Hebrews, of um, Romans 10? If you, what? Conf- finish it for me. Confess Jesus as Lord. The translation as Lord, I think, is better than is. There's no verb there. But in light of the context and who the uh, referential identity of Lord, if you follow the pronouns, right, and the references of Lord from 9 to 13, it's the same Lord as verse 9 and verse 13. Confess Christ as Lord. It says, you won't be disappointed who put their, whoever puts their faith in Him. The Him goes back to Jesus as Lord. It's the same Lord of all. Same Lord as verse 9. Then in verse 13, a few verses later, whoever calls upon this Lord will be saved. Right? Where did that come from? Paul quotes what? Joel 2.32. In other words, Paul is identifying Jesus as Lord, Jesus as the Yahweh of Joel 2.32. And there's many places in the New Testament where a, a New Testament author would quote an Old Testament passage referring to Yahweh and apply it to Christ. I just gave you one of them. Jesus is presented fully as God in John 1. 1 one of my favorite passages is John 18. Now, remember, when in John 1, 1, and we know how the Jehovah's Witness, how they finagle that text, they strain and write in their New World Translation, the word was a God. Not, and hear this, Not that it's impossible grammatically to have God there as indefinite, but it's impossible theologically because that goes against John's whole doctrine. But we interpret John 1.1 in light of the prologue, not just the grammar of a text, because it's the context and content that determines grammar and word meanings. Not merely you take a word out, and you define it by the word just hanging there, right? That's not how you would, you would fail a hermeneutic class if you did that. John 1, 1, but John 1, 18. No one has seen God. So that takes care of all the Mormons. They think everyone has seen God the Father. Clearly, in 1, 18, it's the Father. No one's ever seen God the monogamous theos, the one and only or unique God who is, who is always timeless existence in the bosom of the Father. He has exegeta, exegeted the Father. Isn't that beautiful? Christ exegetes the Father. He reveals the Father. But He always was existing That participle denotes this, who is, who is always existing in the Father's bosom. And we see this same phrase, who is, in Romans 9, 5. The ancestors are theirs, and from them the physical descent, according to the flesh, came. The Messiah, who is, the same phrase here. Ha'on, who is always timeless existence. God over all, blessed or praised forever. 
And also we find that, I think, applied to Christ in Revelation 1.8. When he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, Haon, always is, timeless existence, and who was and who is to come, the Lord Almighty. Paul presents the deity of Christ in many passages. Titus 2.13, um, he's called God and Savior. The God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Same with 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Philippians 2.6-11, which is a beautiful presentation of the entire gospel there, but it starts off with the phrase, who always is in the existence, or who always God in the nature, always, right? Who's God always? Colossians 2.9, Hebrews 1.3. And also we find the claims of Christ. Now it's interesting because, and... Anthony is, um, he's, he's one of the more proficient debaters out there and Christian apologists against Islam, as you'll hear today. And as anyone dealing with Muslims know, their main objection, show me where Christ said, I am God, worship me, right? And it's, I mean, that, that's like their big gun. Um, is there a passage where Jesus claimed to be God, where he says, I am God? Is there a passage in the New Testament content where Jesus says, I am God? Is there? Name one passage where he says, I am God. Now, of course, that leaves the Christian struggling because, well, John 8.58 or John 1. None of these passages, though, does Jesus say, I am God, literally like that. Because you have to remember... That in the Old Testament, who was called God? Elohim. Who was called God? Judges, mighty men, angels, right? They were called God, not in an ontological sense, but in, and false gods were called Elohim. But judges were called God because they represented the Word of God. They were called Elohim. Look in Exodus 18 following. You can see the progression when when Moses was having great difficulties with domestic problems and all kinds of problems, with so many people coming to him, all, you know, if he had email, it would be just stacked up all the time. He, and the great advice of his father-in-law at that, he delegated people to help him to represent the word of God, and they were called what? They were called Elohim. Take up before the judges in our translation, but the word is Elohim. Here's the point. If Jesus were to say, I am God, so what? Maybe he was claiming he was an angel. Angels claim, you know, we find Elohim applied to them. Maybe he was claiming he was a judge. Maybe he was claiming he was a, a mighty man. God says to Moses, I'll make you like God. Okay? That would have been ambiguous and vague. Jesus instead used terms and phrases that only Yahweh used. Nobody else. Like the I am phrase, the ego ami. In the Old Testament, that was only used of Yahweh. Like Deuteronomy 32.39. Isaiah 41.4, 43.10, 48.12. I am was used, non-predicate, in the Septuagint, only for Yahweh alone. Now, the Jews understood clearly what he meant because they wanted to kill him for claiming that. First and last, another phrase only used by Yahweh in the Old Testament. Nobody else used it. No judge, no mighty man, no prophet. Nobody used it. I am the first and the last. But Jesus applies it to himself in Revelation 1.17, Revelation 2.8. Right, um, twenty two thirteen, and Jesus in the New Testament was the only one that applied that to himself. So you see where this is going. He used terms that were unambiguous. He didn't say "I am God" because that wouldn't have meant much, but he used words in which the Jews understood and "Son of God." See, if you claim you're the Son of God in an ontological way, like Jesus did. <clears throat> the Jews would understand that you were claiming to be equal with God. We see that in John 5, 17, 
and 18, when they wanted to kill him all the more, because not only was he claiming God as his father, right? Because he says, my father is at work to this very day. But he was, he was loosing the Sabbath and he was calling God his father. And the narrator says, John, making, making, he kept making himself equal with God. Oh, by the way, the word calling there, he was calling his, um, God his father in perfect tense there, meaning it was a repeated action. Evidently, this wasn't the first time he claimed that he was the son of God. And the Jews said in John 19, 7, we have a law and by that law he ought to die because he claimed he was the son of God. See, they knew the unique way Jesus claimed to be son of God. So that's why you're not going to find Jesus, a masterful communicator, saying, yeah, I, I, I am God. It wouldn't have meant much. But he used words and phrases that were much more clear. Um, Jude calls him the only master and Lord, right, in Jude 1 4. Which is, I, I tell you, if you ever deal with, you have a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses here? Okay, they're everywhere, right? I found this is one of the most problematic verses for a Jehovah's Witness. Because their Bible hasn't changed it in Jude 1 4. Most modern translations read this way. The only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Only one article. The only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. It doesn't say the Master and the Lord, but only Master and Lord, meaning the article governs both descriptive phrases and it's applied to Christ. How, Jehovah's Witness, is Christ the only Lord? How? What happened to Jehovah? Very problematic. I've used it many times. And of course, Jude 1.5 is my favorite variant in the New Testament. It's yours too, right? My favorite variant. You know, variant readings are abounding in the New Testament text. Um, most of the manuscripts read, the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt. And I know Anthony's going to enlarge on this point when he talks about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. In Jude 1.5, which is congruent with 1 Corinthians 10, you know, with the rock, it was Christ that delivered the people. But most of the manuscripts say, there, there's a few different readings, but most of them, good manuscripts, will say the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt. There's some other variants, God delivered the people, but a good reading is Lord. However, because of more manuscript evidence and versions in the Old New Testament, Translations like the ESV and the latest edition, 28th edition of the Nestle Allen Critical Greek Text, we find that the best reading would be Jesus delivered his people out of Egypt. Jesus delivered his people out of Egypt. You look in the narrative and it's Yahweh that delivered the people out of Egypt. Yes, that's our whole point. Jesus is Yahweh, but distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit. But my favorite variant, it only, to my knowledge, it only occurs in one manuscript. But it's the earliest manuscript of Jude. First and second Peter and Jude. We have this, this one manuscript on papyrus, which these three books are contained. It's the earliest ones. The earliest one of these three letters. The earliest one of Jude in one five says, not the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, not God delivered his people out of Egypt, but it reads like this. Theos Christos delivered the people out of Egypt. God Christ delivered the people out of Egypt. It's beautiful. God, but that is our doctrine. It may not be a viable variant, but it's my favorite one. All right. Um, and Jesus was presented as creator of all things. Not in one passage, but in many passages. Um, and as we'll see later in that Anthony's presentation, that the Holy Spirit is also the creator of all things. We find the Father is creator of all things. The whole Trinity is involved in creation, just like your salvation. In John 1.3, John had just told you that God was the Word. That's how it reads syntactically. God was the Word. 
in verse 3, Panta, all things, dia alto agenita, all things through him were created. All things through him were created. Paul also, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, by him, all things were created. Ta panta, the all things were created. Both in heavens, earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, everything. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, sunestakain, all things hold together. I mean, Paul uses four different prepositions, so nobody will make a mistake and get it wrong. And of course, Colossians was written as an anti-Gnostic polemic who did not believe in matter, physical matter. So as a refutation, he presents Christ as the actual agent of creation. Using four different prepositions, it's beautiful. And in him, everything holds together. And we see this construction uh, through him in other places like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Hebrews 1, 2, Hebrews 2, 10. Christ is presented as an agent, not as a helper, but the agent of creation. And also he was worshipped as God. It's interesting, the Father actually, in Hebrews 1, 10, the Father actually addresses Christ the Father actually addresses Christ as Yahweh, the unchangeable creator. Remember Hebrews 1.10? Hebrews chapter 1 is a beautiful contrast between Christ, the eternal Son, and everything else created. Right? But when he gets to, I'll fast forward to verse 10. The Father is directly addressing the Son. He's even used an evocative case there. I mean, it's, a, it's Lord in the direct address. He says, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the heavens and the work of earth is, is your hand did it. You laid the foundation down. You're the creator. The heavens are the work of your hand, right? That is a citation from Psalm 102.25. <clears throat> Through 27, Hebrews 10, 1, 10 through 12. The father citing, remember the father's speaking. The author of Hebrews is recording the father. He addresses the son as the Yahweh of Psalm 102. Because if you go back to 102, that's Yahweh being presented as creator of all things. So the father affirms what we're affirming this morning. And of course... The son was worshipped. He was worshipped by the men in the boat, Matthew 14, 33, in a religious context. Remember, the word worship, proskuneo, can mean falling before someone in a religious context or a non-religious context. How do you know? Context. That's how, it's the only way we can determine the interpretation of the word. Does it mean fall before someone or worship? And Hebrews 1, the setting is in heaven. It doesn't get more religious than that. And in verse 6, again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he commands the angels using a tense of urgency, an arius imperative, you angels, worship the Son. All you angels, it says all the angels, are commanded to worship the Son. Now, there's many other places we can go, but I wanted to lay this groundwork before we speak about the third person, the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Thus far, we have one God. Here's our three fundamental truths of the Trinity. One God, right? Number two, the second fundamental truth of the Trinity, there's three persons called God. We looked at the Father. We didn't need to exhaust that because there's not much opposition to that in terms of concept. The Father is God. Number two, the Son is God. And we just 
from a surface fashion, we looked at some of the passages that affirmed the Son's deity. He's God-man. He's not just God, right? He's God incarnate, the God Christ. Now, the third person is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to use the remainder of this message for next time. But when Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am, you will perish in your sins, right? It's not just believing in Christ, It's believing in His finished work and it's believing in the nature of God in which He shares with the Father and Holy Spirit. So when we come back in part two, I will address God the Holy Spirit and we will establish why in the Christian faith we see God the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit as a person. and I'll use the term unipersonal, meaning He's one person distinct from the Father and Son, we see Him as deity in the same quality of deity as that of the Father and Son. Let us close in prayer. Dear Lord God, thank You that we again come here to explore Your Word. And the whole goal here, Lord God, is to glorify You and be effectual proclaimers of truth. And we thank You that we're privileged that we can, we have the abilities to hear the Bible We have the abilities as Christians to understand the content and to worship you rightly. As Jesus said, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and truth. So let us worship you in spirit and truth and keep getting better at it.